This is a City of Bloomington Common Council meeting for January 20th, 2021. Will the clerk please call the roll? Yes, Council Member Rallo. I'm here. Volan. Here. Rosenbarger. Here. Scambaluri. Here. Sims. Here. Flaherty. Here. Piedmont Smith. Here. Smith. Here. Sandberg. Here. Thank you. Okay, welcome colleagues and welcome to everyone in attendance this evening. Um, we'll go down through the agenda summation. First, we'll have approval of minutes. Then we'll move down to reports. Um, I'll remind folks that we have a maximum of 20 minutes set aside for each portion of this section. But of the reports, we'll have reports from council members. Then we'll have reports from the mayor and city offices. Um, tonight, we have a report from the Commission on Hispanic and Latino Affairs, their annual report. And the mayor would like to um, speak this evening. Then we move to council committees. And finally, we have public or comment from the public. Um, I will remind people that these are on items not on the agenda. Then we'll move down to appointments to boards and commissions. Then we'll have legislation for second readings and resolutions. Um, we have one this evening that is ordinance 21-01 to amend the city of Bloomington zoning maps by rezoning seven acres of property from residential medium lot R2 to employment EM regarding 1600 West Fountain Drive, Comcast petitioner. Um, then we'll move down to legislation for first readings to amend Title Eight of the Bloomington Municipal Code entitled Historic Preservation and Protection to establish a historic district regarding the core building historic district. And then ordinance 21-05 to amend title eight of the Bloomington Municipal Code entitled historic preservation and protection to establish a historic district regarding the Boxman Mitchell building historic district. Then we're going to have additional public comment. Then we'll deal with matters uh, regarding the council schedule and after that, then we shall adjourn. Okay, we'll move back to approval, approval of minutes. President Sims, I move that the minutes from June 1st, 2005, June 15th, 2005, October 5th, 2005, and November 16th, 2005 be approved. Second. Thank you, it's been properly moved and second. Uh, will the clerk please call the roll? Yes, Council Member Volan? Yes. Rosenbarger? Yes. Scambaluri? Yes. Sims? Yes. Flaherty? Yes. Piedmont Smith? Yes. Smith? Yes. Ooh. Sandberg? Yes. And Rallo? Yes. Okay. Okay. Go ahead, Mr. Parliamentary. Oh, <laughs> nothing. Uh, I was waiting for you to, to call the vote and approval. <laughs> Pardon? Uh, I was just waiting for you to, to uh, read the vote tally and, and say that the minutes were approved. Um, I'm sorry, so sorry. For, if I confused you by unmuting. I didn't no, 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 I did. I was, okay. <laughs> that was approved nine to zero. Um, and now we'll move down to reports. Um, I'll start up with, as I see them, council member Volan. No report, except uh, I'm very happy to see this day finally come. Thank you. Councilmember Sandberg. Thank you. I, um, as many of my friends and family today have just been um, ecstatic with the inauguration, the um, traditional, uh, but yet untraditional approach during a COVID crisis. I thought the mood uh, and the tone was just pitch perfect from the very beginning to the very end. 
and the hard work that uh, lies ahead for this new administration. I wish the best to President Biden, Vice President uh, Harris. Uh, they have big jobs ahead of them. And I understand congratulations are also in order for Ms. Don Johnson, and Mayor Hamilton happens to be her husband. Uh, she was sworn in today as senior counselor in, with the DOJ in the Office of uh, Legal Counsel. And uh, we all know her good work in this, this community, and we know she's been there before assisting uh, with um, legal matters in, uh, in the nation's capital. And so we wish her well as well today. Very good news all across the board. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Sandberg. Councilmember Rallo. I have no report, thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Scambolari. Um, All of that. All of that. It's a good day. Other than that, no report. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Piedmont Smith. Yes, um, I'd like to thank um, all of the staff of Beacon Inc. and the board and all the volunteers who came together to establish a low barrier winter shelter for um, members of our community experiencing homelessness. It was an amazing task done in just like 10 days. I just am really, really impressed with uh, how quickly that came together. And it's just a godsend for people in our community. So thank you to the Reverend Forrest Gilmore and everybody at the Beacon and everybody who chipped in. Um, I also wanted to uh, say that um, I, I hope you all uh, had a good experience on Martin Luther King Day. Um, I attended a conference at, that IU put together uh, where we had the honor of listening to Angela Davis and Alicia Garza, um, two just incredible women who have um, uh, pushed forward uh, on racial justice issues. And um, that evening I was so uh, excited by one of the panels, which was on um, the, uh, progress or lack of progress from slavery to mass incarceration that I, um, I actually skipped the evening session with the city of Bloomington, I'm sorry, um, but I watched the, the documentary 13th by Avra DeVernay and it was just, well, it was depressing as hell, but it was really eye-opening um, how our society has rebranded African-Americans as criminal and mass incarceration as really uh, just a, a shameful way that we have treated a, a large segment of our society. So a lot of work to be done. I hope you all um, took some inspiration on MLK Day. And of course, I agree with my colleagues that um, this is a wonderful day for the United States with a president who has intelligence and common sense in the White House. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Piedmont Smith. Councilmember Flaherty. Sure, just a few brief um, uh, items tonight. Uh, first, I wanted to let um, the public members of the public know that I'm hosting my first constituent meeting of the year next Monday at 5.30 p.m. Uh, there will be a Zoom link possibly on the council's website, but certainly on my own um, council Facebook page at facebook.com slash Flaherty for Bloomington. Um, I plan to host them on the third Monday of the, of the month uh, throughout the rest of the year, but um, we went with the fourth Monday this month because of uh, MLK Junior Day, of course, which we were all celebrating on Monday. Um, and lucky enough for <coughs> Councilmember Piedmont Smith, the uh, City of Bloomington's program uh, with Dr. Khalid El Hakim, which was great, um, is uh, recorded and available on the um, annual Dr. Martin Luther King Junior Birthday Celebration page um, on the city's website. So anybody who missed the program can see that there. It was a really good program and inspiring as well and really impressive. Uh, what, what that commission put together and we've, with support of city staff, of course, as well uh, for um, technically difficult uh, times to be producing the celebration. Um, so appreciate all the work that went into that and, and thank our commission and staff members for that. And that's it for me tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Flaherty. Councilmember Smith. I have no report tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Rosenbarger. Hi, no report. Thank you. Thank you. Um, what I'd like to report, first of all, I too join in on the congratulations um, for Don Johnson. Um, 
I had kind of been hoping and was wondering if I'd hear this kind of news, um, and particularly in light what happened to the last time and uh, the administration wasn't able to use her very vast and um, expert abilities during that time. So I'm looking forward and very congratulatory for her to uh, be able to um, serve this nation. Um, I'd also like to thank the organizers of the cities, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. birthday celebration program. Um, it was jam packed with information, with entertainment, um, we had a great host. Um, uh, with particular um, acknowledgement for the African-American Choral Ensemble and our speaker. Um, it, it was just exciting that evening and um, it made me again feel proud to be a Bloomingtonian. And lastly, um, I just wanna share with everyone else how proud I'm feeling with having our inauguration today, um, a peaceful, transition of power, um, well, halfway anyway, I think, <laughs> but a peaceful transition of power. And the most important thing is that I feel a sense, a renewed sense of hope and a renewed sense of possibilities um, as we move forward on into uh, this new term. So uh, all in all, a good day for the United States of America. Okay, thank you all for your comments. Um, we'll move down to the mayor and city offices, their reports. Um, I think first we'll hear from the Commission on Hispanic and Latino Affairs, their annual report. Um, I don't know who will be presenting this evening. I believe we've got Nico Sigler here and he should be able to uh, unmute and turn on his own video. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Sigler. How are hey, you? I didn't know I was able to do that. Otherwise, I would have done that and spoke up. My bad. All right. That's quite all right. Um, thank you for presenting the report and please proceed. All right. Good evening, council members. My name is Nico Sigler. I am the president of the city's Commission on Hispanic and Latino Affairs. And tonight I will be giving the commission's annual report. To start it off, I would like to say on behalf of all the members of the commission, we would like to thank Mayor John Hamilton and the city council for supporting this effort and for allowing us to be part of it. The Commission on Hispanic and Latino Affairs works to identify and address issues that, in that impact the Hispanic and Latino populations in Bloomington, especially in the areas of health, education, public safety, and cultural competency. We recognize that our work has been affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, for example, we had to cancel our annual Blackie Brown Arts Festival this year. We hope to bring it back in 2021 though. Despite this, the commission was able to find new successes in some areas and build on existing programs from prior years. The following are some of the accomplishments and projects that the CHLA has worked on throughout the year. Thanks in great measure to the hard work of Josefa Madrigal, the Fiesta del Otoño was made possible and the CHLA was there tabling the event. The commission would also like to thank Josefa for all she does for the CHLA and the Latino community here in Bloomington. The city of Bloomington is lucky to have her on staff. We have also participated in community conversations with the Monroe County Community School Corporation. These conversations introduce members of our school community to the work of the CHLA. During these conversations, we discuss ways our school communities can support our Hispanic and Latino students, families, and staff in our community. We also went over identifying ways that school communities can continue to build their cultural competencies and foster culturally responsive and ongoing practices and policies that positively impact Hispanic and Latino students. This has been an unusual year, but we believe the commission has done its best during, this, during these unique circumstances. We hope and expect that our work in the community will continue to grow and improve in the coming year. Thank you. Also, if you have any questions, I'm here for that too. Hey, thank you, Mr. Singler. Do we have any questions of Mr. Singler from council members? Okay, seeing none. Thank you, Mr. Singler. Thank you. Y'all have a good night. All right, thank you. And now we have um, our mayor, John Hamilton, present, who would like to um, 
use some time during um, this comment period. Mayor Hamilton. Thank you very much. It's nice to be with you. Um, following Nico and Josefa, uh, thanks for all your work too. And I think this is my first meeting this year with the council. So congratulations to your new officers. And I look forward to a, a good year of work with you all. Um, I also uh, appreciate uh, how many of us got to see that Biden inaugural message of unity, um, his message to quote, a great nation of good people where you could feel a recommitment to competence, to public service, to healing and ending political polarization, to truth and compassion. Um, as, he, as he said, not an end to disagreements or debate, but a focus on, as he put it, the common objects of our love. Um, uh, I, I heard in his words, uh, and echo, we have a great community filled with good people, with a hunger for community and with disagreements, of course, but with also many shared values, including compassion and the value of housing as a right for every person. I wanted tonight to give an update about housing insecurity in our community, which is very real and threatens to get worse including challenges for people experiencing homelessness. Uh, I think you know my deep commitment to affordable housing. In my professional life for decades in community development and at Family and Social Services Administration and, and in my personal life, uh, including helping found Shalom now Beacon 20 years ago with Shirley St. John, Joe Emerson and many others serving on and indeed chairing its board uh, and volunteering overnight with the Interfaith Winter Shelter. Uh, I care deeply about improving housing for all. Um, I wanted tonight to frame things uh, in the city of Bloomington and housing. Um, housing first is our goal, getting people into safe, decent housing as quickly as possible and for the long term. Um, just as a quick summary, we have about 1,400 units of affordable housing that's overseen by the Bloomington Housing Authority. I know you're aware of that. And in addition, over the last five years, we've developed 850 affordable units, over 1,300 bedrooms, uh, including particularly three new developments focused on supportive housing for those experiencing homelessness uh, or with other special needs at Crawford Two, at Southern Knoll, and at Kinzer Flats. I'll just note that that overall affordable housing support has come from a few million dollars of city money that has leveraged well over a hundred million dollars of overall investments in, in that affordable housing. Together in Recover Forward, also, we took strong steps to invest in our social safety net uh, in the last uh, months, including, as you know, we added uh, $500,000 to the Jack Hopkins program. Uh, I convened last spring a task force on food, housing, child care, and personal services that steered millions of dollars into those basic needs during the pandemic. Uh, we are lowering housing costs with energy efficiency investments and making new investments in affordable home ownership as well. And just in the past 30 days, um, I have met with housing funders and providers and asked uh, Tina Peterson of the Community Foundation and Efra Pfeffernan of United Way to continue their leadership with a regional effort to identify shared strategies on housing insecurity for our community and our region. Uh, regarding COVID and, the, and housing, we have expanded and strengthened the emergency shelter network with a new isolation shelter at a local hotel that our community has supported, uh, an expanded women's shelter. Uh, we've collectively expanded physical space at existing shelters. Uh, and as uh, Council Member Piedmont Smith mentioned just yesterday, another new shelter at the warehouse opened, managed by Beacon. And 
Now, despite all this good work and amid the ongoing pandemic and economic crisis, many people are still struggling in our community with lost jobs, with poverty, with substance use disorder or mental illness or domestic violence. Um, and in November and December, Seminary Park uh, area increasingly became a place where people gathered during the day. Uh, at times, sometimes regular day shelters were closed or limited due to COVID. Um, and tents and structures were used in the gatherings and, and often left overnight. While few, if any, people were sleeping overnight before December, uh, at the request of providers and partners, the city refrained from removing tents overnight or from public rights of way through the holiday period in order to give time for individualized assistance to identify safer sleeping options. Uh, for a time thereafter, uh, overnight camping did occur uh, there and increase there. Indeed, as you all know, one individual tragically died Christmas Eve uh, from exposure to the cold in that downtown location. Uh, I, I wanted to share some, some key facts about the recent weeks of intense collaborations. Um, first, there have been very strong partnerships uh, that exist with the city and providers who, who are helping individuals, uh, including Centerstone, Wheeler, New Hope, Middleway, Beacon, uh, and other direct care providers who are helping individuals find safer options and services that are needed. Um, I also want to call out and thank uh, city staff who have been working extraordinarily hard uh, in those collaborations, including uh, Beverly Calendar Anderson, Mike Decoff, Adam Wayson, Paula McDevitt, Mary Catherine Carmichael, and their staffs. And I know you appreciate the work they do on behalf of, of all of us as well. Second, beyond those collaborations, I, I want to note it is not safe uh, to congregate in public rights of way, especially next to a busy street overnight or any time, uh, especially during potentially slick or icy conditions of winter where one traffic accident could have terrible consequences uh, to those next to the road. Um, Third, uh, I want to point out it, it is not safe to sleep outdoors in an Indiana winter. Um, of course, the death of an individual Christmas Eve made that very poignant. Um, I know from my own experience with Interfaith Winter Shelter how powerful the sense of at least safety in the night, uh, overnight, for folks who faced such challenges, how important having those safe places of respite was uh, and is. And, and fourth, uh, in terms of kind of facts about where we are, the emergency shelter beds uh, in our community are in numbers well in excess of those sleeping overnight in seminary. And they're available in significant numbers beyond those who were sleeping overnight in seminary every night, uh, as mentioned, including two new low barrier shelters uh, in the last month, the women's shelter uh, and uh, the one at the warehouse managed by Beacon. I want to thank all of the partners uh, who worked so hard, as I've mentioned, many of them over the many weeks of outreach, helping individuals find better options. Um, we went from as many as 20 sleeping eventually in the park uh, in late December down to 15 uh, gradually with this kind of work and then down to 12 and then down to eight and we were counting uh, regularly how many people were actually overnighting and then last Thursday uh, down to three who intended to sleep outside and finally those two two of those agreed uh, were helped to go to other places and one remained for some time. I know some disagree with the decision uh, to insist that individuals not sleep overnight in city park uh, locations or in rights of way next to streets. Um, but working with our partners, I believe we are protecting safety and well-being of all. Um, I, I, you know, I, I urged that we enact new revenue last fall, including $250,000 annually 
for increased homeless services. Uh, you weren't ready to take that step then. Uh, I believe the need continues and, and indeed may be growing. And I will continue to ask for new revenue for that purpose and others. Um, I hope all of us I know who share the values of housing security and advocate for additional housing services will join in support in the near future. Uh, I really appreciate the time tonight. Uh, I know how busy you are. I appreciate the shared commitment to compassion and to housing as a right for all uh, and, and appreciate working together toward those shared goals. Uh, I'd be happy to answer questions if you have any and appreciate your, again, your time tonight and look forward to working with you. Thank you, Mayor Hamilton. Do we have any or questions from council? Council Member Rollo. Thank you, Mayor Hamilton. I, I want to express my appreciation to you and your staff for working uh, with uh, to bring people together from uh, the direct care providers to work on this difficult uh, topic. Uh, my question was about the low barrier shelter at the warehouse. Um, I understand that <clears throat> the city also played a role in that. Can, could, could you uh, tell us a bit more about how that came to be? Sure, and, and thank you for all the work together on this. Um, I actually urged, uh, I spoke with um, Reverend Gilmore, I think January 2nd, uh, and urged that they consider expanding that space. The, the warehouse has such space in it where they had moved Friends Place uh, and urged them to do so. I'm really glad they did and have. Um, uh, we worked very intensively, particularly Jason Moore, the fire chief. I didn't. I don't think I listed him in my litany. He, he too uh, has been very involved in helping assure that that building and that location is safe uh, for those uh, and 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 worked. Uh, uh, quite intensively over weekends, I know, to help make that happen. And I, I, it is difficult singling anybody out uh, because uh, all those people I mentioned and so many frontline staff have worked very, very hard to try to help uh, our community live the, the compassion and assistance that we want to see. And I, look, I know not everybody agrees with these steps, and they're, they're certainly valid uh, uh, approaches that people can advocate. I'm I'm uh, proud of the work that our community has done and will do to keep trying to keep everybody safe in this community. Thank you. Council Member Sandberg. Thank you. Uh, Mayor Hamilton, I know that you have convened several meetings uh, over the course of this, uh, this community, um, obviously a, a huge com community need. Um, and there's going to be another meeting coming up on the 25th that I have been invited to attend and I'm happy to, that is going to be convened by the United Way and the Community Foundation through the leadership of Brock Pfefferman and Tina Peterson. Um, what do you hope uh, will be further accomplished there? I know funding is a huge part of this and um, uh, what do you anticipate will be coming from um, this meeting? Well, thank you for that question. Um, you know, early in the pandemic in March, uh, knowing the challenges our social safety net would have, um, I asked five philanthropic leaders, including those two and, and three others to, to, to form a task force to think about how to coordinate the emergency needs for housing, for childcare, for food, et cetera, during the pandemic. They did a terrific job and they worked very closely with all the direct providers. Um, and I think partly through that multi-month effort, um, it became clear that, that there was some opportunity uh, on an on ongoing basis to look at housing insecurity, uh, particularly with some of the pressures we've seen. And so I did urge that those two in particular, uh, United Way and Community Foundation, really take a regional approach because you know this is, this is not a problem that will be solved only by the city. Of course, we really need more money from the nation and the state, and I hope that will happen. Uh, but at least regionally, and, and we felt that I felt and others that those two would be a good regional convening place. So the, I think the hope is a couple things. One is to help coordinate and uh, align the investments, both public and philanthropic, uh, trying to deal with housing. And two, to try to help measure and um, uh, monitor the impacts that we're making to see that we're moving in the right direction. I believe housing first will be the 
kind of the motivating principle there uh, to to try to get housing insecurity lowered, working toward the the the, the um, realization of housing as a right. That's a that's a big challenge, and it's hard to do as a single region in the face of other issues. But I think that group can really help us regionally and in a focused way uh, to steer money and to assess how we're doing on both of those things with a wide table at which the city will be a strong uh, presence, but not uh, alone with, with many other partners. Thank you. Just a follow up to that, because funding is such a huge piece of affordability with housing, as as we all know, as we, you know, certainly as I work with the plan commission. Um, do you anticipate, again, that we will be getting um, some additional help from the feds and the state with respect to the dollars that we need to to provide that housing? Again, it's it's difficult um, without the proper funding. I'm not even sure that lo at locally we have the resources to be able to garner, you know, what's what's going to be required here. Well, those are really important questions. Um, I, I just to answer briefly, I think uh, we w we have COVID related funding, which is helpful, and we may get more of that um, in the new administration for this short run period, uh, ho however long that that lasts, and that's really important for some of the emergency shelters and hotel isolation space and and other things like that, emergency shelter expansions and such. I, I think in the longer run with the housing first model and the principle that everybody should have safe and decent housing that's not emergency shelter, but that's that's reliable housing, that is a huge money question. Um, you know, locally, we're doing a lot with, with many hundreds of units. Um, we're leveraging the housing development fund that you all helped create some years back, a few years back. We're we're trying to do all we can, leveraging with the CDFI friendly Bloomington, which has brought in almost $30 million of funding. And as I mentioned, we're making progress. But I, I mean, ultimately, we do need federal and state help with this. Um, housing money goes quickly uh, when you start looking at the numbers that we have. Um, I, I do like to remind people that, you know, it's the Bloomington, Bloomington Housing Authority is housing several thousand people every night in public housing through. Uh, primarily Section 8 vouchers, but also a couple hundred units that we own. Uh, and and they have a waiting list of 700 people when they open their waiting list. And they don't leave it open most of the time. There's desperate need for more housing. And so I, I think there is a lot we can do locally, but we we partly we continue to need to pressure and push a state and national leaders to do more with us as well. Thank you. Okay, any further questions? Council Member Smith. Hi, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Mayor Hamilton. I appreciate it. And uh, I'm, I'm so glad that, that you have outlined the, the different steps that the city has taken, um, you know, over, over the course of the last, you know, several months. I think it's really important that people know that. And, and so um, I have two questions kind of, is there a, uh, a number, uh, uh, a dollar figure that the city, the, you can say that the city has put forth um, and expended to help uh, decrease the, the homelessness uh, issue in our town? Uh, you know, I'm actually trying to get that number. I, there's, of course, a lot of direct personnel costs uh, and program costs that we we don't, we, the short answer is I don't have that yet. Um, it's certainly a large figure. And then besides the personnel, there's infrastructure, housing support that we give to partners uh, in the building of housing. But I, I do believe we need more, but I am gonna try to get that number. I just couldn't get it for you yet tonight. I did, I'm, I'm looking for it. Well, uh, thank you. And is there any possibility that we get additional HUD certificates for, um, for Bloomington Housing Authority or for the city to be able to distribute? Um, not that I'm aware of, uh, Council Member Smith. We, we have gotten some special HUD appropriation through our hand department uh, with COVID uh, support. Uh, and and I, I didn't mention Dora Sims, which is a major mistake given the president of this council who is so kind to my wife, by the way, <laughs> thank you. Uh, but but uh, Dora Sims at hand, of course, has been directly involved in the production of so much housing. And Amber Scobie, who runs a housing authority, uh, is working very hard to scrub and scrape and find 
resources. I do think you'll hear an announcement out of the Bloomington Housing Authority in the days and weeks ahead uh, relevant to this, but I'm, I'm not at liberty to share that yet. She swore me to that, and um, uh, I'd be happy to get that information as soon as we can. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. And by the way, thank you all for such kind words about my wife. She appreciates it, and uh, uh, I, I'll pass those all along to her. Thank you. Point, point of order, thank President you. Sims. Can, yes. We've um, now passed the 20 minute, 20 minutes well, allotted for this in our schedule, so we could either... Yes. Um, well, actually, um, we had just, I wanted to let him finish. And can my colleagues indicate how many more would like to ask questions? Okay, I see two more. Um, if we have no, uh, do we have any objections from colleagues to finish these two questions? Okay, we'll have two more. Um, does that meet what we need to do, Council Member Flaherty? I believe so. Okay, thank you. Council Member Volan. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And yes, shouts out to both uh, Don Johnson and Doris Sims, who still works for you for another nine days at least, I think. So uh, good that you, that you mentioned her. Um, the, I appreciate the report. Uh, I know that the challenge that you're facing right now is, uh, is it, that you're trying to address with your administration is a difficult one. Um, one thing, though, that uh, occurs to me in listening to you speak is um, we have this tremendous opportunity um, a couple blocks away um, with the new, uh, with the old hospital site. Um, I'd like to know, uh, based on what you said tonight, to what extent, uh, how much housing um, you plan or hope to see uh, on this site with land that will soon be owned by the city that will be social housing or uh, housing that could be used by the Bloomington Housing Authority or otherwise for very low income uh, or transitional, you know, housing first type housing. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Um, and I'll be brief. I know you're uh, yeah, yeah. to time, but um, the master plan, which was released last week and shared with the Redevelopment Commission uh, on Tuesday this week uh, outlines, I'm sorry, can you hear me all right? Yeah, sorry, I, yes. I, uh, I was breaking up. Go ahead. Okay. The, the master plan, which was recently shared with the Redevelopment Commission, contemplates um, the development of hundreds of units of housing. I think it's in the range of six to 800 units of housing in that area. Um, that plan, and I, I assure and am confident that the community will want to see significant amount of that housing be uh, dedicated housing um, we have not yet, and I think the community needs to go through a process to think about how much, what percent, what kinds. Uh, that will be a, an ongoing discussion uh, that was not part of the master plan to say X hundred like this or 200 like that uh, or how much uh, affordable. I think it's always a question of, of cost uh, as well as opportunity. So that's really an open question. I think we expect to have a wide range of kinds of housing there from, uh, from market rate to very affordable. Uh, and it's a community discussion and balance that'll still, still needs to be made. Well, I, um, you know, this land is unique in that the city actually will own the land and can therefore be very specific about what we are others mm -hmm. losing okay. audio. Council, uh, council member Bolin, you're breaking up um i'm going to go to council member scambalori and then uh, we'll come back I, to you and then we'll come back to you if that's okay council member scambalori thank you um mayor thank you for the report obviously this issue is top of mind for all of us so i appreciate you checking in on it um i'm really interested in what you said about the need for a regional approach to this issue something that just spans more than just what goes on in Bloomington. Um, could you say more about that? Could you say more about why that's necessary and what what a regional effort could look like or what's being discussed so far? Sure, um, and, and you know, our, our housing partners and the providers, I think all agree on this, that, that Bloomington serves as a regional hub in so many ways, including uh, for emergency housing and uh, uh, affordable housing, sheltering and such. Um, 
And we know that many of our surrounding counties don't have resources like this, but they do have people who need them. So we want to work together with our entire region to think about housing security. Often a best location for somebody who may be experiencing homelessness is to go back home to get support, to be back around their families and, and their networks. Uh, but that's complicated. It's hard to use just a crude, it's hard to use city money to support someone going back and living in Owen County if, if that's a better place for them for a housing first and long-term options. But so we really need to coordinate with not only uh, our county friends, but also the, the surrounding area. And I think uh, the United Way and Community Foundation can really be helpful in that conversation. That's helpful. Thank you for that context. So. Thank you. Council Member Boland, would you like to try briefly to finish up your thought? You had frozen before. Yes, thank you. I've tried to close some programs in hopes that my uh, stream would come through better. Can you all hear me okay? Yeah. Yes. All right. Uh, so yeah, just the follow-up question, Mr. Mayor, is uh, unlike um, you know market rate PUDs where we have very limited ability to influence what gets built, here the city will own the land and so we can really dictate uh, anything that we'd like, it seems like there's no better opportunity to make a commitment to dozens or hundreds of units uh, being made available to uh, low or very low income residents. Um, what, you know, uh, I know that ultimately the city, the community is going to decide altogether what we want, but you have a great deal of influence here. What would you say? Well, I, I agree with you. I think this is a really important opportunity to try, try to create a, a, a fair and just and equitable community that has housing for all. Uh, I think uh, I will expect and be advocating for a wide range of housing types there. Uh, I think it is a great opportunity for us. I'm very excited about it. I appreciate the support to invest the money to, uh, you know, to buy the land and we're gonna have to invest more money in infrastructure. We started talking about that in the RDC also. Um, and those investments will help us do things uh, that we want for our community. And we're going to be listening as we continue to listen to the community about all those goals. Absolutely center to my uh, thinking about that is it creates really powerful opportunities for affordable housing. Thank you. Thank you all. Okay. Thank you, Mayor Hamilton, um, for speaking with us this evening and answering questions. Thank you very, very much. Thanks a lot. Um, and I'd like to uh, thank my council members for indulging us to take a few minutes to um, hear more on this very, very important topic in our community. Okay, do we have any council or reports from council committees? Okay, seeing none, um, I do have two um, quickly as I can. Um, on January 20th, um, the Public Safety Committee, um, of which I chair, had a um, a meeting for the intent, for the intentions of receiving information from um, our citizens that are experiencing homeless homelessness, um, those that are advocates and supporters of um, that population, and we also expected to hear from uh, some of our social service agency partners who assist in that matter. Um, we had scheduled it for two hours, uh, had many community members participate. Um, in fact, we reduced the time limit for comments to three minutes so we could accommodate um, everyone that was in attendance. Um, very robust discussion, um, very emotional, very passionate from many of our speakers. Um, one thing that I will highlight is that we were asked by someone during the meeting, um, what did we intend to do with um, um, the information and or with some of the questions that were asked? Um, and I just want to let the public know that, um, and I'm speaking for myself, I think I can speak for the uh, committee members as well as council members at this point. Um, there's much information I'm still going through and determining uh, where to direct um, some of those questions. Um, there weren't a whole lot, but there were some and uh, very possibly to give more thought and maybe 
um, address some of the issues and comments that were brought up. So um, I will also say uh, there was a comment on uh, some of our citizens who expressed disappointment that the mayor or city staff was not present. Um, and I, as chair, um, take full responsibility if that's such a case, but it was a choice to not invite any um, one from city staff because the purpose of this meeting um, or the intent was, was to receive information from those that were most affected and closest to the unhoused population. And um, so I just wanna thank everyone for participating in that. And um, uh, sure we'll hear more about that later. Um, lastly, if I may, um, part of the packet addendum today is the 2021 um, assignments, council assignments to our standing committees. Um, we do have nine standing committees um, after legislation um, and some of the previous committees uh, were rolled into other committees. Um, so now we have a total of nine and I am happy to say that that allowed every council member to be the chair of one standing committee each. Um, again, that notice is in the packet addendum. It is, should there be any changes after tonight um, and after further discussions, there may be one or two, then we will um, announce that and make sure that they're posted, uh, any corrections are posted again. Um, and thank you for that. Um, did you have anything, Mr. Lucas? I. I would suggest if, if you're intending as, as council president to uh, to make appointments to those various committees that the uh, those appointments actually be read out loud so that they can be included in tonight's meeting okay. record. So I, I know it might be a bit tedious, but I suggest uh, going through those and listing out the members of each of the committees. Okay, not tedious at all. Thank you, and it's my pleasure. Um, I will go down the list. We'll start with the administration committee. That will be chaired by council member Volan and members will be council members Scambaluri, Flaherty and Sims. Moving to the climate action and resilience committee that will be chaired by council member Matt Flaherty and members will be council members Rollo, Piedmont Smith and Smith. Community affairs committee that will be chaired by council member Rollo and members will be council members Volan, Sandberg, and Scambaluri. Housing committee will be chaired by council member Rosenbarger. Members will be council members Flaherty, Sims, and Piedmont Smith. Moving to the Jack Hopkins, um, I drew a blank on the two S's, social services committee. Um, that will be chaired by council member Sandberg. Members of that committee will be council members Smith, Scambaluri, and Rosenbarger. Moving to the land use committee that will be chaired by council member Piedmont Smith and members of that committee will be council members Rosenbarger, Flaherty, and Volan. Public safety committee will be chaired by myself, council member Sims, and members will be council members Sandberg, Volan, and Piedmont Smith. Sustainability Development Committee will be chaired by council member Scambaluri, and members will be council members Sandberg, Smith, and Rollo. And finally, the Transportation Committee will be chaired by council member Smith, and members will be council member Rosenbarger, Rollo, and Volan. So, Thank you very, very much, um, council staff, for that reminder. Um, now we'll move to public comments. Um, first, I'd like to remind everyone that you can um, uh, indicate your intent to speak by using the raised hand function in Zoom and or sending us a note in chat. And I would like to remind members uh, of the public that you may sp speak on matters of community concern not listed on the agenda at one of the two public comment opportunities. Citizens may speak at one of these periods, but not both. Speakers will be allowed five minutes 
but this time allotment may be reduced by the presiding officer if numerous people wish to speak. Um, how many do you see offhand, Mr. Lucas? I believe I see four hands raised, uh, five now, and I know there may be a, one more that comes in through chat. Um, so six at the moment. Um, okay, as it stands now, I think um, we'll allow five minutes. Who do we have first? Uh, first we have, and just, Five minutes per speaker would, would total 30 minutes. So if that's the council's uh, desire, and, and now I see another. That, uh, I'm sorry, do we have, well, okay, let's back up. How many do you see? I'm sorry, I can't see what you see. I, I see maybe seven, uh, seven folks now who'd like to speak. Uh, six hand, hands raised and, and one message that came in over chat uh, and more coming in each moment. So I, I think giving folks a moment to, uh, uh, to find the raise hand feature uh, or to just type in their message may be a good idea. Um, again, maybe eight folks now at the moment. Um, okay, and seeing that we have that many and maybe more coming, um, uh, do I need to, can I just change it, the time limit? And I'd like to say, two minutes to accommodate everyone? Yes, the, the person okay, I think can adjust the, the time given. Thank uh, you, and we'll go two minutes each person and hopefully we can accommodate everyone. Who do we have first? First up we have uh, Tassie Gennady, who should be ready to come. Hi, thanks so much for giving me your time and thank you, Mayor, for attending this meeting and speaking about an issue that I know is really close to a lot of our hearts um, that we've been spending a lot of time on. I just wanted to rectify one inaccuracy. Um, the tents were first cleared from Seminary Park before the holidays. That was the first clearing, it was earlier that week. Um, and then uh, later when the gentleman died, um, we had returned most of the staff members of the community had redeemed their things from Parks and Rec, um, but it's possible he lost belongings in that first sweep. Um, the second sweep was just days before the winter shelter opened, which it sounds like you did know from the beginning that it was coming. So I wonder why we couldn't have dovetailed those more closely and that it meant that there were days where there were people who didn't really have access to those extra beds there um, and who it was very heavily utilized last night. Um, there were about 30 people in line as of 830, which was really great. Um, and that brings me to, um, I know IU South Bend has, or sorry, you can tell I work for IU. I know that South Bend has recently opened a 24 hour warming station. And I worry a little bit about our friends sort of waiting until nine o'clock at night um, to get into the low barrier shelter. I think it's an amazing, amazing thing. Um, but I wonder if there's a, a possible way um, that we could sort of investigate that as a next step. And finally, I'm gonna go back to those CDC guidelines that say, um, don't disturb encampments. Both Missoula and Denver have embraced this. They're as cold, if not colder than we are. Um, and they've actually helped people shore up their um, winter camping stations. That's it, thank you. Thank you very much for your comments. Who do we have next, Mr. Lucas? Next time. And, be have and before we get started, I think I'm at two minutes apiece with 20, then you, uh, is the limit, will the limit be 10? Uh, yes, unless the yes, council. okay. So if we can identify those, that would be appreciated. Okay, who's next, please? Uh, next up, we have uh, the screen name is Moco Green, but I, that may be the Monroe County Green Party. Uh, they should be able to unmute. Thank you. Can you identify yourself, please? You have two minutes. Thank you, Councilman Sims. My name is Will Staley, and I'm with the uh, Monroe County Green Party, and. Uh, with the homelessness situation and with the ever increasing home prices, and I know Bloomington is building more and more apartment complexes and also uh, building duplexes and other housing types. However, that hasn't really solved the pr uh, home prices and lower, and lower rent. Uh, my question is, what's the likelihood for the city council and Bloomington in general to either 
uh, increase or pass an additional uh, low housing income tax credit in order to help folks with rent or uh, be able to purchase homes for themselves. And I thank you guys for your time. Thank you for your comment, Mr. Saylor. Who do we have next, Mr. Lucas? Next up is Jim Shelton. Good evening, Council. Jim Shelton with the Chamber, but speaking again on behalf of CASA, our Court Appointed Special Advocates. I want to make sure everybody knows that we have a training session coming up in just about, well, just under three weeks. It starts February 8th. We'll run through uh, March 3rd. Applications are due just about now, so we need people to step up and volunteer. We've got about 27 children right now waiting for somebody to volunteer to advocate for them uh, as they're in the court system because their parents have uh, abused or neglected them. So please think about this. It's a wonderful volunteer opportunity. Uh, the next training session after this won't be until June. So this would be a good time if this is something you've been thinking about. But if you need more information, go to MonroeCountyCasa.org. There's a volunteer link that has a frequently asked question page and a bunch of other info. Or you can call 333-2272 and talk to the staff and get any concerns you might have answered. So thank you for that opportunity to spread the word. Thank you, Mr. Shelton. Who do we have next, Mr. Lucas? Next up is Nicole Johnson. Hi, Ms. Johnson, you have two minutes. Hi, thank you so much. So I appreciate the updates on everything. There are some alternative storylines happening here I'm not getting into because I only have two minutes. What I wanna say is thank you everyone in Bloomington um, who has helped and for their continued support of the most vulnerable in our community. Um, but we, this isn't enough. Um, Monroe County has 150,000 people in it. And if numbers, published numbers hold true, that will put about 7,000 of our friends and families into an eviction process come the end of this month. Our houseless community is going to grow regardless of the mitigation attempts by existing agencies and both this city government and Monroe County government combined. Um, people are on average, according to statistics, over $5,000 in debt. And there is not one single current proposal in any level of government that is going to stop the fallout. It will not always be winter. It may be cold here, regardless of what everybody says. These tents are going to be needed when it's not winter. We're going to have an increase in our houseless population. The most important reason for adhering to the CDC guidelines or considerations for encampments until individual housing is because this summer we are going to see large numbers of our friends and families in situations there's no way that CARES money is going to stretch that far. I'm sorry it's just not going to happen and the evictions are going to proceed and that's all I really have to say. And that's what needs to be looked at. We need to mitigate. For 50 years, Bloomington has been in a housing crisis. Mr. Smith, thanks so much for you acknowledging uh, the, the mayor's account of the last few months. What about the last 50 years? I yield my time. Thank you. Who do we have next, Mr. Lucas? Uh, next, we have Greg Alexander. Hi, Mr. Alexander, you have two minutes, please. Uh, great, thanks. Uh, my name is Greg Alexander. Um, as you might imagine, I have used a lot of different channels to ask the city to remove things which were blocking um, the pedestrian right away. Long story short, I haven't had much luck. So I was astonished to see police being used to remove homeless people from the right of way along the edge of Seminary Square. And not even because they were blocking right away, but simply because they had nowhere else to stay. The administration cited the danger to the people from being in the right of way. In fact, a homeless woman was recently killed in the right of way, but she wasn't camping. She was merely using pedestrian transportation. There's federal gui guidance that specifically recommends an eviction moratorium should apply to homeless people and that homeless people should not be forced to move into congregate living situations. It's easy to forget that guidance came from Trump appointees. We're liberals. That's not how we do things. In 2017, we had a task force. They came back with a few concrete suggestions, one of which was really obvious. The city should provide toilets where homeless people congregate outdoors. 
Three years later, we're still still sending police instead of porta potties. We've had enough talk. It's not that complicated. We need to stop using police to punish homelessness. You need to act. Thanks for your time. Thank you, Mr. Alexander. Who do we have next, Mr. Lucas? Next is Marshall Bailey. Hi, can you hear me? We sure can. Go ahead, Mr. Bailey. You have two minutes. I'm starting my clock now. So my name is Marshall Bailey. I'm a Bloomington resident. I'm a military veteran. I'm a proud American. I've worked at the White House, Walter Reed National Military Medical Center, helping move in warriors. Uh, I've worked at Pentagon. Uh, I came to Bloomington about uh, two years ago, a month ago. Uh, I saw people getting kicked out of the park. Since then, I have physically been there during each one of the evictions. I'm going to state for the record that a lot of the statements that were made are factually inaccurate. There is constant gaslighting going on here, and a uh, systematic displacement of the unhoused homeless is also going on. Basically, when you kick people out of the park, you steal their belongings, those numbers go down, and you just repeat that process over and over and over. The number is being reported 20, down to 15, down to 12, down to 8. Those numbers are factually inaccurate. Those weren't the numbers that were there, and those weren't even the numbers that scattered. Uh, the mayor made a, a, a series of, uh, of statements. He, he referred to we in terms of setting up the city shelter by urging Reverend Givemore. He used the term we to claim credit for the work the fire chief did. Basically, he's systematically displacing people. He sends the police down there every night, and they take the blame. Just so everyone knows, there was another eviction that occurred last night. No one knows about this, but this happened last night because he sends the police there every night. And I physically moved for the homeless over to the winter shelter. There's a way to do this if you're against homeless, and there's a way not to. The way that you've executed this process is illegal a million different ways, from notice to destruction of personal property. I call on anyone with legal background to join a call to start filing lawsuits on this. That's it. Oops, I'm sorry. Thank you, Mr. Bailey. Who's next, Mr. Lucas? Next up is Nathan Mutchler. Hi, Mr. Mutchler. You have two minutes. Thank you very much. Um, first off, I'd like to ask how, in the mayor's words, compassion and housing first equals removing people's tent, because for some people, a tent is a home. I have in my notes the mayor is misleading you. I'm going to say the mayor is lying to you. The number of beds available doesn't match one-to-one -one with the people outside. What about people who are on ban lists because of behavioral issues? What about people with substance abuse uh, challenges? What about people who just want to stay with their family? Don't they deserve to sleep somewhere safe or do they deserve to be chased off into the night? Um, some words I heard tonight, someone at the meeting means that I'll sleep better tonight. I'm in a celebratory mood. Today is a good day, a renewed sense of hope. You know who doesn't have a renewed sense of hope? You know who's not going to sleep better tonight? And you know who would, might not say today is a good day? our unhoused brothers and sisters who are chased and harassed around this town. They are not in a celebratory mood. They are not having a good day. They don't have a renewed sense of hope. It wasn't Donald Trump or Republicans who did this. Our mayor, our Democratic Party, our community did this. You recognize that who is in power has meaning. So use your power to do the right thing and stand up to our mayor. I yield my time. Thank you, Mr. Mushler. Um, who do we have next, Mr. Lucas? Uh, next up is Alex Goodlad. Go ahead, Mr. Goodlad, you have two minutes. Thanks. Hello, so I just want to just, you know, it, it, what, what we're hearing is that, you know, it's gonna be great with Joe Biden as president and that, you know, we've gone rid of the fascists and, um, we'll have less misinformation. Well, we're, get, we're getting misinformation at the city level and 
I, I think we should remember that um, even at the national level, not much better. We, we, we have a guy, of, I mean, Joe Biden, who like lied about um, whether he was arrested at, at, at Nelson, the Nelson Mandela um, protest. So uh, yeah, and, um, and I just want to get into how Hamilton is, is not just misleading, but lying to kind of second Nathan, what Nathan's saying. He o completely omit, like he talks about, you know, urging Forrest, but but he doesn't listen to Forrest when, when he says that there was 39 people at one point in seminary. He acts like that number lowered. And we, we brought this number to his attention countless times. And all we get is just, um, you know, disingenuous shrugging from, uh, from Andrew Krebs and, uh, and, and Mary, um, Car Mary Carmichael. And, um, and, and, and even Andrew Krebs admits in, in the city page that, yeah, both numbers are true. But why, why the fuck is Hamilton just uh, not acknowledging that number at all? Why is the city in their statement, like, keep on um, messing up that number? I, I, like, um, why, why is the city freaking lying? And, um, and he talks about unsafety. Why does that not apply to Wheeler when uh, uh, conditions are unsanitary? Like, oh, safety is important, but it's not important with uh, with Wheeler Mission. And, 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 oh, it's illegal to camp, but, oh, it, it doesn't matter when uh, Wheeler's breaking probably the First Amendment with uh, holding Sunday services. And I'm, I'm tired of it. I'm mad. Nobody seems to care. And um, if you're really going to, like, um, claim credit, John yes. Hamilton, you should... Uh, Mr. Good lad, I'm sorry, but can you finish up? Thanks. Thank you. Um, Mr. Lucas, do we have time for anyone else or do we have any more? Yes, uh, I think we have two more um, and that would total 10. Uh, next is Sam Curry. Yes, hello. Uh, I want to voice my support tonight for measures to increase the availability of housing in Bloomington. Uh, Bloomington is a thriving, growing community and it is important that as the population grows, so does the availability, the availability of housing. Uh, I understand the council will soon be considering a proposal to allow a greater range of housing types in certain zones of the city. I hope the council will approve of this plan and similar measures to support new housing. This issue is especially important for me as a renter who has seen his rent increase every year he has lived in the city. And I hope the council considers the interests and needs of renters as they make their decision on this matter as renters form an important part of the community. And I do think a greater availability of housing will help address some of these problems with rising rents. Thank you for your time. Have a good night. Thank you for your comments. And who do we have finally, Mr. Lucas? Finally, we have RM. I think that may be Renee Miller. Uh, should be ready to comment. Um, good evening. Hi, Ms. Miller, you have two minutes. How are you? I'm okay. I'm okay. Um, I'm a little discouraged. I've been coming to meetings now, city council meetings for two years, and I didn't start really vo being vocal until fairly recently. And what I'm noticing is there is a lot of gaslighting, and I think we're, we're going to need a fact checker. Um, I, in fact, I know we need a fact checker. Um, the mayor uh, spoke a lot of falsehoods. Shame on him. Uh, one in particular that really made it, he was just talking like uh, he wanted to sound like, the, he was romanticizing what he was doing, saying that he waited until after the holiday. Well, let me tell you what wasn't after the holiday. There was a sweep on Seminary Park on Veterans Day. Veterans Day, what day did Veterans Day fall on? Anybody know? Can anybody there tell me? I think it was December, don't quote me exactly. It was the 11th, 13th, but it certainly wasn't after the holidays. Shame on, shame on him. I mean, displacing veterans or anyone for that matter, um, and then pretending like he waited until after the holiday is, is uh, just criminal, criminal behavior. You need to fact check him. You need to fact check yourselves. You're letting all this just like, seem all romanticized and pat each other on the back. Um, there's a lot to this. I hoped that eventually some, some people actually listen. And I do 
appreciate the few council members that actually do listen and I know who they are and I'm glad they're in my district. Thank you. That's all I have. Thank you for your comments, Ms. Miller. Um, I want to thank everyone um, in the public for their comments. Um, before we move on, I would like to remind everyone that that was one of two public comment opportunities that we have on the agenda. And please also remember that citizens may speak at one of these periods, but not both. So we'll have another period um, later on the agenda. Moving on, do we have any appointments to boards or commissions this evening? Okay, seeing none, we're moving down to legislation for second readings and resolutions. Mr. President, I move that ordinance 2101 be introduced and read by the clerk by title and synopsis only. Second. It's been properly moved and second. Will the clerk please call the roll? Yes, council. Sorry about that. Council member Volan? Yes. Rosenbarger? Yes. Scambaluri? Yes. Sims? Yes. Flaherty? Yes. Piedmont Smith? Yes. Smith? Yes. Sandberg? Yes. And Rollo? Yes. Okay. Thank you. That was past 9 0. Will the clerk please? Read. Yes. Ordinance 2101 to amend the City of Bloomington zoning maps by rezoning seven acres of property from residential medium lot R2 to employment EM regarding 1600 West Fountain Drive, Comcast petitioner. The synopsis is as follows. Ordinance 2101 would rezone seven acres from residential medium lot to employment. Your land use committee recommendation is due pass 400. Thank you. Um, uh, Mr. Lucas, who do we have here to present this evening? Um, President Sims, I'm, first, I'm, I'm sorry. I move that Ordinance 2101 be adopted. Second. It, okay. Thank you. Um, Councilmember Scamblery couldn't get unmuted. Thank you, Councilmember Smith. Um, and thank you, Councilmember Flaherty. Uh, Mr. Lucas, who do we have to present this evening? I believe we have Eric Grulick from the Planning Department, as well as our representatives from Comcast. And if any of them need to uh, to be able to unmute themselves, they can send me a message via chat. Uh, but I believe Eric Grulick is here to, to kick things off. Thank you, Mr. Grulick. Are you um, prepared? Yes, I'm ready whenever you guys are. Go right ahead, thank you. Okay, great. Uh, hopefully everybody can see my screen. Yes. yes. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, so as mentioned, this is a request uh, for Comcast for a property that they have at 1600 West Fountain Drive. Uh, the property is zoned R2, which is residential medium lot. Um, so the petitioners are requesting to rezone this property um, from the R2 district to the employment district in order to allow for a new building to be constructed on the property. Um, so this is located on Fountain Drive, uh, just west of Adams Street. Uh, Fountain Drive has a mix of land uses along it. Uh, south of the railroad tracks, uh, you have a mix of single family, multifamily uses. Uh, however, as you proceed west on Fountain Drive, just north of the railroad tracks, uh, you encounter predominantly industrial type uses. Uh, just across the street from this, you have JB Salvage and Auto Parts. Um, further up the street, you've got Plumbing Services, uh, Harold Fish Supply, uh, a wide range of industrial uses along Fountain Drive. Um, so this site has been used by Comcast uh, for several decades. Um, over the past 20 years or so, they've undergone several expansions on the site. Uh, at each of those expansions, because the property is owned residential, they have received a use variance to allow for new buildings to be constructed. Um, and so they received a use variance at, at each of those times. Uh, however, the use variance process is no longer in the Unified Development Ordinance. Um, so the only recourse for them to allow for any work on the site uh, is to request a rezone. Um, so with this petition, what they are requesting 
would be to remove the northern uh, utility building that is on the property building. Um, so that the area of the expansion would still occur um, within the developed area. Uh, so you can see there's asphalt and concrete uh, immediately adjacent to this building on the west side. Uh, that is the area that the building would be expanded in. Uh, this would also allow for them to take, take down a communication array that is on the property uh, and bring that inside the building. Um, so the site is predominantly used for utility trucks, uh, for utility trucks, for service vehicles, uh, storage of equipment. Um, so this is classified as a contractor's yard um, in the zoning code. And so that is why they are requesting to rezone this to the employment district where that use is a permitted use. Um, so we do have a, a site plan kind of showing the site as it exists. Uh, as you recall from the aerial, uh, there are several trees, uh, treed area that surround the overall buildings uh, and parking area. Uh, none of the trees would be removed as part of this petition. Uh, there's also a sinkhole that is located on the west side of the property. Uh, so that, as well as all the, the trees that are on the site, would be set aside in a conservation area. Um, as I mentioned, the building addition, which you can see by this blue arrow, would just be occurring over areas that are already developed on the site. Um, so no additional disturbance in any of the trees or the sinkhole areas um, would be required. Um, so the comprehensive plan has this site uh, kind of a split designation. The east half of the site or at least one third of the site is designated as mixed urban residential while the, while the western two thirds is designated as employment center. Um, so the, the kind of split designation on this property uh, pretty much matches up how the property has been developed. Um, so the petitioner's request to rezone the property to employment um, would match the, the designation of the comprehensive plan for the portion of the site uh, that is, that is uh, facilitating that use. Um, so the eastern one third of the site uh, where it is designated as a mixed urban residential, this would all be set aside in a preservation easement to protect the existing trees, uh, which would also act as a buffer between uh, this use and some of the single family uses to the east of this. Uh, immediately to the north of this, you have a church uh, and then as well another industrial use immediately to the north as well. Um, so there would be a protection against some of those uses as well with the preservation easement. Um, so as I mentioned, the, the kind of split designation on this site, uh, the portions that are zoned employment center, the comprehensive plan encourages uh, professional business offices, light assembly plants, um, flexible tenant facilities, uh, the kind of uses that, that are, are occurring on the site now, uh, which also allow for some light uh, manufacturing uses, um, which as I mentioned, mentioned uh, matches what is on the site currently. Um, so the plan commission did review this petition uh, and found that the rezoning of the site to employment would match the comprehensive plan. Um, would further many elements within the comprehensive plan, including environmental preservation uh, and allow for the use that is on the site to continue. Um, and so they did vote nine to zero uh, to forward this to the common council with just the two conditions of approval. And with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay, thank you very much. Um, before we go any further, um, does the chair of the land use committee care to offer a report? Sure. Um, so the Land Use Committee met last Wednesday and uh, it was a relatively short meeting. Um, we talked about this proposal. We heard from uh, two representatives of the developer um, and um, our questions were uh, pretty minimal. We ask about a sidewalk along the frontage of Fountain Drive, and we're told that there would be a side path that the city has long planned to put in there, and that the developer would pay into um, towards the cost of that side path, uh, rather than putting in their own sidewalk, um, so that it all, you know, can be done in one uh, project. And there was a question about the large um, uh, tech tower that's on the site that's going to be removed because those transmissions are now being done from elsewhere. Um, and generally we were uh, the we were concerned of course about um, 
looking at the environmental impacts, but uh, there is an easement um, through the course of this particular petition, it was found that this easement was not recorded. So that will be recorded, um, but that will protect the, uh, the forested parts of the site. And I think we were pretty much convinced that uh, this was um, a low impact petition because the building that they're uh, building is going to be in the place of a different building that's already there and they're not gonna disturb any uh, any new land. It's um, just gonna, it's already, it's already, it, the new building will be built on land that's already been disturbed either uh, with an existing building or a parking lot. So, so we voted for zero to forward this to the whole council. Thank you very much. Uh, do we have any questions from councilors? Council member Rallo. Well, I, I have a question, but it just occurs to me, did we want to hear from the representative from Comcast before we proceed? Mr. President. Well, if he has anything to offer, I thought Mr. Grulick. Um, has Mr. Grulick covered it? Is, what's, I believe so. Mr. Grulick, does a representative from Comcast care to address us this evening? Uh, yes, Matthew Kelly is representing the petitioner. Thank you. Are you ready, Mr. Kelly? There we go. I'm sorry, this, I'm working from my phone. But yes, uh, we are in support of this and it is a terrific opportunity to get that tower um, removed. So uh, local residents and the city should hopefully uh, appreciate that. And we are looking forward to working with the city um, to, to get this accomplished. So if you have any questions, I'd be more than happy to answer them. Thank you very much. Uh, I believe we have staff and petitioner here for questions. Um, Council Member Rallo. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I realize that this is a rather benign uh, impact uh, because the impact already exists and it's expanding in an area that's already been developed. But Mr. Grolick, I wondered, about um, you, the rendering you you placed up for us uh, showed a sinkhole, and I believe a twenty foot buffer as per code. Is that correct? I'm not hearing, Mr. Are you there, Mr. Gerlich? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. I think I, I may have cut out there. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, this is on the west side of the site uh, that was required to be set aside with previous uh, use variances uh, for whatever reason that kind of fell through the cracks, but we'll make sure that that does get resolved on this time. Um, there would be no encroachment within that, that sinkhole area. Um, you know, the area of disturbance would be on the north side of the site and as we mentioned, that's in an area that's already been developed. Yes, so what I'm seeing is a sinkhole boundary and then a 20 foot buffer. Is that correct? I can't read the writing. So uh, it should be a 25 foot buffer, but yeah. 25, 25 foot buffer, I forgot code. So my question is, so there's parking adjacent to that. And so we know that, you know, parking leaves oils and metals and things like that. Just out of curiosity, I'm not saying that, the, you know, that what is that this would prevent my vote in the affirmative, but I'm curious about whether we review that the runoff from this parking lot goes into that sinkhole. Do you happen to know where- so that, the, is, the that is not something, um, so I, I do believe there is this, certainly doesn't allow for stormwater detention um, to be directed to a sinkhole. Um, you know, there, there's nothing that necessarily says that you cannot divert anything. Um, so I'm not, I'm not sure if the parking lot has a standing curb around the perimeter of it. Um, you know, certainly that would act to dissuade or prevent water from running into that sinkhole. Um, yeah, I don't know if the petitioner has that specific information or not. Um, okay. 
I just wanted to flag that because it's a, it's been a concern of mine that you know that we do we do have that uh, buffer by code, but if we if we have the discretion of a PUD, we might want to consider in the future, you know, where the runoff from a parking lot, and this is a, a quite a small parking lot. There's not much in the way of vehicle parking, but you know you could see that being problematic if it if it flows into a sinkhole, you know. Uh, even with the 25 foot buffer. So if we have the discretion to somehow mitigate that, I think it might be a future consideration. So that's that's the nature of my question. So thank you for addressing it. Thank you, Council Member Allen. Do we have any further questions from the council members? Okay, seeing none, we'll go to the public. Um, or public comment on ordinance 21-01. I will remind everyone that if you would like to speak, you can indicate by using the raised hand function in Zoom, or you can send us a message on chat. Do we have any takers, Mr. Lucas? No, I don't believe so. Thank you. Give it just a few more seconds. Okay, seeing none, we'll go back to council. Do we have any further council questions? Seeing none, do we have um, council final comments? Did I say a hand, Council Member Bolin? No, no, okay. Council Member Flaherty. Yes, I'll just, uh, for the benefit of the public, uh, briefly mention that this was discussed at greater length during the committee meeting last week and um, some comments were made there. And I know Council Member Piedmont Smith gave our report, but just uh, given the relative paucity of questions and comments tonight, I, I didn't want people to think that uh, we haven't duly considered this. And, and, um, and so, yeah, just wanted to mention that. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Rallo. Just reiterating what I said before that maybe for future code uh, considerations and, and when uh, we have the discretion of uh, PUD, which of course is one of the considerations is demonstrable public good that we might consider um, features like, like this CARS feature that might be receiving more or less directly uh, uh, you know, runoff from an impervious surface. Um, so just just to put that out there for our consideration for the future. Thank you. Thank you very much. Council Member Volan. Yes, um, I, uh, uh, as Council Member Flaherty has said, you know, I found very little <coughs> problem with this uh, proposal. Um, but I did want to say uh, a, a reaction to something Council Member Rallo said the notion that if it were a PUD, we might have some more control over it. I mean, it's my understanding that the uh, UDO, the new version of the UDO was designed to reduce arbitrariness of PUDs. Um, but with that reduction has come a lack of uh, ability to control uh, for council members to have some control over things. And in fact, what we're looking at here is a rezone, not a, a PUD which is, you know, we're gonna be seeing uh, more of those than PUDs in the future simply because PUDs really aren't, you know, gonna happen anymore, uh, at least not very often in my, is my prediction. So I don't know if we uh, entirely bargained for the change of the UDO. Uh, I don't know whether we should be concerned about it on just something that uh, having served on land use for a while, I'm a little concerned about, uh, uh, you know, some of the missed opportunities that uh, the emphasis on PUDs has uh, removed from our ability. Thank you. Oops, sorry. Thank you, Council Member Bowen. Do we have any other final comments from Council Members? Okay, seeing none, are we ready for the question? Okay, will the clerk please call the roll on ordinance 21-01? Yes, Councilmember Rosenbarger? 
Yes. Scambolari? Yes. Sims? Yes. Flaherty? Yes. Piedmont Smith? Yes. Smith? Yes. Sandberg? Yes. Rallo? Yes. And Volin? Yes. Okay. Thank you. That is adopted 9 0. Um, we'll move down to legislation for first readings. President Sims, I move that Ordinance 2104 be, int be read, introduced and read by the clerk by title and synopsis only. Second. Thank you. It's been properly moved and second. Will the clerk please call the roll? Yes. Councilmember Scambaluri? Yes. Sims? Yes. Flaherty? Yes. Piedmont Smith? Yes. Smith? Yes. Sandberg? Yes. Rallo? Yes. Volan? Yes. And Rosenberger? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. That passes 9-0. And are you ready for me to read? Yes, I was waiting. I didn't know if Council Member Flaherty had anything. Um, will the clerk please read? Yes. Um, Ordinance 2104 to amend Title VIII of the Bloomington Municipal Code. Oh, dear. Entitled Historic Preservation and Protection to establish a historic district regarding the core building historic district. The synopsis is as follows. This ordinance amends chapter 8.20 of the Bloomington Municipal Code entitled list of designated historic and conservation districts in order to designate the core building, the building located at the southeast corner of parcel number 530805100058000009 located at the corner of West First Street and South Rogers Street in the city of Bloomington, Monroe County, Indiana as a historic district. Built in 1947, the core building still retains its physical integrity, architectural significance, and association with the history of healthcare and medicine in Bloomington. While it was not the first hospital building constructed on the site, it is the oldest surviving building and is therefore part, a part of the city's healthcare legacy. The building is not listed on the National Register of Historic Places, nor has it been identified in the state or local historic sites and structures inventories, so it has not been given a rating. However, this is likely because the building is physically attached to a larger hospital complex that was built in various decades of the late 20th century, which most architectural historians would find non-contributing. Regardless, the core building is one of the few examples of Art Deco architecture in Bloomington and stands as a testament to the evolution of the original Bloomington Hospital site from farmhouse to medical complex over the course of the 20th century. Thank you very much. Um, moving to the next item in first reading. Um, yeah, point of order, Mr. President, I think we should consider a um, Motion to refer to committee uh, first for this item before moving on to ordinance 2105. You're absolutely right. I was thinking of doing those both together, but that wouldn't be proper. So thank you. Um, well, you wish to offer a motion, Council Member Flaherty? Uh, I'll actually defer to any um, committee chair, perhaps, who would like to, to move we refer uh, to a committee. I'll note that our code requires uh, that we consider a motion to a standing committee. Um, prior to a, a motion to consider um, uh, a referral to committee of the whole. So I would await any motion from uh, a relevant committee who would like to so move or other, any other member. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Volan. Uh, I think Council Member Piedmont Smith was going to do Council it, but I was going to. Council Member Piedmont Smith. I move that uh, Ordinance 2104 be referred to the Land Use Committee. Second. Second. Okay, it's been properly moved and second. The clerk, please call the roll. 
Uh, sorry, and just a quick note so, that the, the motion is debatable. Uh, if any council members had, had a reason to that they wanted to share or discuss uh, as to why they would vote for or against the motion. If not, that's okay. Um, excuse me, Mr. President. Yes. With that motion, did you want to include a date and time? Oh. Um, My apologies. The, I'm the sorry, is correct. Thank absolutely you. Absolutely right. Um, since I made the motion, I suppose I should correct the motion. Um, do we have any other meetings already scheduled for next Wednesday? Or would it just be standing committee meetings that are decided tonight? Well, it'll be standing committee meetings um, scheduled tonight. And then after these two, um, whether they go to standing committee or committee of the whole, then we still have the administrative administration committee um, to consider. Oh, okay. Uh, so I'll amend my motion and, and say that I move that ordinance 2104 be referred to a hearing by the land use committee next Wednesday, January 28th, 27th, 27th <laughs> uh, starting at 6 p.m. Second. Okay, it's been properly moved in second. Um, before we go to the roll, is it time for debate, Mr. Flaherty? Yes. Okay, do we have any comments from council members? Okay, I'd like to comment if I may. Um, and thank you for those um, um, uh, motion and second. Um, we've heard from um, Mr. Hedrick on both of these. Um, and I think, well, actually on this one, we'll talk about the other one later. Um, but I was wanting to refer it to committee of the whole um, I think that in this particular um, ordinance 2101, I think that there will be discussion that will be valuable with all council members in attendance having to do with um, property on the hospital site um, and maybe some further um, discussion on the historic, pres historic preservation um, process itself. Um, so that's my comment. Um, but it, before it can go to the committee of the whole, then we must consider if it goes to a standing committee, um, which is what we're doing correctly now. So do we have any further comments? Okay. Um, and Mr. Flaherty, um, on this one, and I know it's debatable, we're not seeking public comment on this, are we not? No. Nope. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, thank you. Do we have any further comments from council? Okay, seeing none, are we ready for the question? Will the clerk please call the roll on ordinance 2101, I'm sorry, 2104 uh, on this motion for referral? Yes. Mr. Uh, President, could you, excuse me, um, could you restate the motion is to go to Committee of the whole or to go to land use? Land use committee. Okay, thank you. Hey, do, do we need to repeat the motion before we go any further? Okay, thank you. Clerk, will you please call the roll? Yes, um, Council Member Sims. No. Flaherty? No. Piedmont Smith? Yes. Smith? No. Sandberg? No. Rallo? No. Volan? Yes. Rosenbarger? No. Scambalori? No. Okay. Thank you. And that fails seven to two. Um, um, Mr. Parliamentarian, before we go to the next one, um, is the next motion for this to go to the committee of the whole? Uh, yes, that'd be correct. And just a quick uh, point of information, uh, the motion failed two to seven, or I'm I think, sorry, I think two, we normally say it that way. Yeah. 
Yes, and, thank and yes, you. yes, yeah, we could entertain now a motion uh, to refer to Committee of the Whole, and I think by default, per our code, that would be a 6.30 uh, p.m. meeting. That is correct. So moved. Second. Okay, it's been properly moved and seconded. Do we have any debate or comments from council members? Council Member Flaherty. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to briefly mention that um, I didn't have particularly strong feelings about where to send this or the, the petition to follow. Um, and in particular, we wondered whether housing or land use would be a good fit. Um, and, I, and I think historic preservation as a, as a commission is under how the housing committee. Uh, but the two ordinances tonight about historic designations uh, are commercial buildings, not house houses, um, which made me wonder if land use was a better fit. And I, I don't have particularly strong feelings. And I thought um, committee of the whole uh, might work well in this case. So I just wanted to explain my thoughts there. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Um, do we have any more comments? Thank you. Um, uh, moving to the second item on first readings. Um, Sorry, we'll, point of order. I think we do need to vote on the, I think we would need to vote on the referral. We need to vote on, thank you. So that's not automatically going to committee of the whole. Okay, thank you. Um, has there been a motion for it to go? Is there a motion needed and seconded? Thank you. Yes. We've had debate. Uh, would a clerk please call the roll? Oh, um, yes. Councilmember yes. Flaherty. Yes. Piedmont Smith. Yes. Smith. Yes. Sandberg. Yes. Rallo. Yes. Bolin? Yes. Rosenbarger? Yes. Scambaluri? Yes. And Sims? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. And that is adopted 9 0. Um, and I will remind um, everyone and the viewers uh, per statute, the committee of the whole and this uh, ordinance will start at 6 30. Um, next Wednesday, the committee meeting. Moving to the second item on legislation for first readings. Mr. President, I move that ordinance 2105 be introduced and read by the clerk by title and synopsis only. Second. Thank you. It's been properly moved and second. Will the clerk please call the roll? Yes, council member Piedmont Smith. Yes. Smith. Yes. Sandberg? Yes. Rallo? Yes. Volen? Yes. Rosenbarger? Yes. Scambalori? Yes. Sims? Yes. And Flaherty? Yes. Thank you. Thank, thank you. And that passes 9-0. Um, will the clerk please read by title and synopsis only? Yes. Ordinance 2105 to amend Title VIII of the Bloomington Municipal Code entitled Historic Preservation and Protection to establish a historic district regarding the Boxman Mitchell Building Historic District. The synopsis is as follows. This ordinance amends Chapter 8.20 of the Bloomington Municipal Code entitled List of Designated Historic and Conservation Districts in order to designate the Boxman Mitchell Building, 424 and a half South Walnut Street, as a historic district. The proposed district consists of two buildings. The Northern, the northern Building is a one-story wood frame building with a red brick veneer on the northern facade facing an alley and on the east facade facing South Walnuts. The southern building is a two-story wood frame building with a red brick veneer on the east facade. Both of these structures were built in 1925 by Ira Mitchell, one of the Mitchell brothers responsible for a string of commercial structures that were built along South Walnut in the 1920s. The Mitchell brothers left an indelible mark on the urban landscape of Bloomington. They built at least four brick commercial block buildings and a handful of brick homes along South Walnut, all of which survive to this day. These buildings are part of the architectural fingerprint of the city and form a recognizable pattern along its southern corridor. 
The building is also notable for its historical association with Henry Boxman, a local restaurant entrepreneur who operated Boxman's Restaurant from 1929 to 1958. Boxman gained national recognition for his food and also boasted the first neon sign and air-conditioned dining experience of Bloomington at this location. That's thank all. You very, thank you very much. Um, and I will entertain a motion from any council member on committee referral. Council member Sandberg. Mr. President, given our previous discussion, um, would it be appropriate to move that this also be referred to the committee of the whole? I um, think I, I'll check with the parliamentarian. Thank you. Uh, unless Mr. Lucas wants to correct me, I think per the letter of our code, we should still vote on the uh, re a referral to standing committee uh, first. And if we want to, if that's something we want to reconsider and change in the future, we could do so. But that would require a, a motion and a second, correct? Mm -hmm. And um, if by chance it did get didn't get either, I think we would discuss it. Council Member Volan. Uh, Mr. President, I move that uh, uh, Ordinance 2105 be referred to the Housing Committee. Second. Oh, Point sorry. of order, Mr. President, may I ask a question? Yes. Um, if, if someone, perhaps Councilmember Volan or Councilmember Flaherty, could you refresh my memory? Uh, is, is, if it fails, if the motion, if the proper sequence is to refer to a standing committee, and if that fails, is it necessary to have a motion to go to the committee of the whole, or or does it proceed by default? I'll defer to, to Councilmember Roland or, or uh, Council Attorney Lucas if they know. I'm looking at our code now, too, but I might not be able to read fast enough. Mr. Lucas. Well, I don't know if Councilmember Volan has had something to, to add. My, uh, I don't believe that's addressed in, in the local code. Uh, I do believe in an ordinance, uh, possibly from 2012 or 2013, there is uh, a provision that states um, absent a motion to refer to some other committee, uh, a motion to introduce an item will, will include uh, a referral to committee of the whole, but I believe that's conditioned on no standing committee existing that something could be referred to. Um, I'd need to pull it up, but I, I would recommend for tonight's purposes, uh, actually taking a vote on a motion to refer to Committee of the Whole. Thank you. Thank Council you. Councilmember Volan, did you have anything well, to add? I, I missed the last thing Mr. Lucas said. Uh, for tonight's purposes, I'd, I'd recommend uh, considering a motion to refer to Committee of the Whole and, and actually voting on that motion. Uh, while I objected to the, uh, the motion for 2104, I'll withdraw the motion to refer to the Housing Committee. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Volan. Do and, you have any? Sorry, <laughs> one more item. I, uh, the, the code is not clear on uh, whether the council has to actually consider a motion to refer to the Standing Committee before, uh, to a Standing Committee before Committee of the Whole or must only prioritize a motion if, if one is made. Um, I, I think in the absence of a motion to refer to uh, a standing committee, the council could appropriately consider a motion to refer to committee of the whole. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lucas. Um, and that was a, that's what I was getting at um, when I referred to if we didn't receive a motion and or a second. Um, but as a point of order, just to yes, Mr. President Sims, I'll just read it so we're all on the same page. Motions for referral to a standing committee shall be entertained before a motion for referral to the committee of the whole. Um, and it sounds it's somewhat ambiguous, but I think yes, if if no motion is made, provided the opportunity was given, we could proceed to a, um, a motion to refer to committee the committee of the whole. Thank you, and Council Member Volan has withdrawn his motion. Um, do we, do we have any motions from any other council members? Council Member Sandberg. Yes, I move uh, referral to the Committee of the Whole. Second. second. Okay, it's been properly moved and second. Um, this is debatable. Do so we have any comments from council? I'm sorry, council member. I'm sorry, Clerk Bolden. Um, just to clarify the motion, council member Sandberg, did you mean on January 27th at 6.30 p.m.? <laughs> Um, 
I would, since there is another matter being heard at 630, I would leave it up to the president to order the agenda as to what goes first and second. Do you have a preference? Well, I, I just be... meant the committee of the whole is at 630 p.m., correct? Right. And we would then have two two items to hear. So that would kind of be up to our president schedule, right? Right. Just verifying the time. Yes. Thank you. Uh, yes, but they would all be part of the committee of the whole, but the committee of the whole starts at 630. So it would be um, sequential. So thank you. Um, this is debatable. Do we have any comments? Um, Council Member Volan. Yes, uh, I didn't speak up on 2104 um, because it was a judgment call. I don't agree, uh, Mr. President, with the idea that um, uh, the core building being on the hospital property itself merits that it needs to be heard by the committee of the whole. I think that the hospital property as a whole needs it, may, it would be something to be heard by the committee of the whole because it's a multifarious uh, proposal um, but we don't even know when it's going to come and it's going to be a much larger package of legislation than this nevertheless the majority has voted for committee of the whole uh, it this is a very related it's another historic property it makes sense to hear it in committee of the whole but i do want to say also that i find it to be really disappointing that there are so many questions about this very basic notion of procedure. We don't need to schedule, for example, the time at which this is heard, if it's being heard at a different meeting. Uh, we don't need to, to I mean, the, the relative lack of interest that I find among some of my colleagues uh, as to uh, notions of procedure is a bit disappointing. And I would ask everyone to be more cognizant of it um, you know, so that we don't have to go through this kind of debate every time. But uh, in general, my, uh, you know, I, I just want to express a mild concern here uh, for um, enthusiasm for Committee of the Whole for items that are only marginally meritorious of it. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any other comments from any council members? Okay, um, I'll make a final comment. Um, my thoughts in the first place that this would be better served. Um, part of the reason for what you said that it was part of the hospital property and and thus the hospital reuse. Um, and I thought that would be part of the debate that would be better served by all council, all nine members present. Um, and that was the basis of my thought of uh, referring to the committee of the whole in the first place, but to follow procedures, um, then we must uh, consider a, a motion to refer to a standing committee is my understanding. Okay, do we have any other council member Volan? Um, we have always had the ability for all nine members to hear and debate issues at meetings like this one, regular session. Uh, I've often questioned what the merit of committee of the whole is when we can simply have a third reading. Uh, that's always been available to us. It's still available to us now. Just wanted to say that for the record, that Committee of the Whole doesn't confer us anything special, any special ability to discuss items that we can't do in the meeting we're in right now. Thank you. Thank you. It's been properly moved and second. Um, are we ready for the question? Will the clerk please call the roll? Sorry about that. Okay, I believe we're starting with Council Member Smith. Yes. Sandberg? Yes. Rallo? Yes. Volan? Yes. Rosenbarger? Yes. Scambalori? Yes. Sims? Yes. Flaherty? Yes. And Piedmont Smith? Yes. Thank you. Thank you, and that passes or adopted 9-0. Um, ordinance 21-04 and 21-05 um, will be scheduled for the committee of the whole meeting, 6.30 next week. Um, thank you. Um, now I think we need, last week we had a, a administration committee meeting um, that wasn't heard during the session and was uh, to be considered at a different time. 
Uh, Mr. Lucas, we uh, discussed this a bit earlier, but the, the question now is to move it to next Wednesday and as part at, in this as part of the administrative administration standing committee. Is that the proper um, procedure? But before we get into matters of council schedule, I, I believe we have an additional period for public comment. Um, no, no, no. We was talking about the administrative committee that wasn't heard last week. That that may be an item more appropriately discussed under council schedule. I, I, I gotcha. Thank that, you. Um, uh, the the chair of that committee. Uh, I, I think that conversation should be under council schedule. Thank you very much. Um, okay, and then we're now for additional public comment. Um, we have a maximum of 25 minutes set aside for this section. Um, I will remind citizens that um, this is the second of your opportunity for public comment and citizens who spoke at the first um, may not be allowed to speak at this one. Um, you will have five minutes um, unless we have um, very many people, then we may adjust the time frame. Mr. Lucas, do you? Yes, first up we have uh, Tina. Thank you, Tina. Can you um, um, Good evening. share with us your name? Can you sure. share with us your name? Thank you. Sure, this is Tina Honeycutt. Um, I appreciate the comments that we had, the first comment, so I'm not gonna go back over all that's been going on. I am going to point out and ask that we really work on the fact that the pandemic is still raging and the city has done nothing to actually put in sanitation stations for our unhoused neighbors. And all of the public facilities that they were able to use during the day, other than Shalom, for the most part are closed. And as such, we are going to see increases in COVID cases and we've seen that that's been happening. Um, that's been reported in several meetings now. And the fact that this has been being talked about for so long, I mean, it's almost a year now that we've been dealing with COVID and there are still no hand washing stations in Seminary Park or in Switchyard Park. There are still no restroom facilities. Um, and that doesn't do anything for our folks. You know, we have the great, the, the new shelter, which is greatly needed and has been greatly used already in the first day, but that's evening. That doesn't help during the day. Um, I am so frustrated that we just keep talking and talking and watching people suffer and freeze and die and don't take care of basic sanitation for folks even. I yield my time. Thank you for your comments. Do we have anyone else, Mr. Lucas? I see a hand raised by RM. Um, I'm not sure if somebody else. Uh... Good evening. Okay. Renee right. Let's please, hey. please not give half truths. Let's start fact checking everybody, Ms. please. Thank you, Ms. Miller. I'm, I, I have a comment, and I think well, everybody should be able well, to have Ms. a second comment. Ms. I don't Ms. know why, why we're trying to mute the public and not give us a voice. Two I'm minutes. Not started out as five, now it's two. How about giving us each another two minutes? Please, President Sims, two more minutes each. Um, Ma'am, that is procedures. We had more people than the time allotted in the first session. That's why we went down to two minutes. You know, um, we, and, we and the rules meetings, are that we well, will not we come. Meetings until midnight. Now they're, they're over by nine o'clock. It's, it's not even talking anymore. We're not even those, being heard anymore. Ms. Miller, I will just remind you that when we do those or have those long comments, those are comments during the legislation. These are public comments 
and it's for items not on the agenda. And the rules are that if you participate in one, you can't participate in the other. I'm so sorry. So I'm going to echo what the last speaker said, and we really need to have some sanitation out in there for our public. I mean, just you yes. and me out there, much less the homeless community. Thank you. Why is that not being Mr. done? It's being done all over. The Mr. Lucas. Okay. Do we have anyone else? I, I don't believe we have any uh, folks who did not speak during the first public comment period. Okay, thank you. Seeing none, um, now we move to matters of council schedule. Yes, yeah, so uh, thank you for your, <laughs> your patience. Um, I think as, as another council member pointed out, um, the administration committee has a holdover item from last year, uh, ordinance 2103 as it's been renumbered. Uh, that committee um, was scheduled to meet last week and uh, that meeting was was canceled and um, the council extended the time for that committee to report to the February 3rd uh, regular session uh, <clears throat> in anticipation of a committee meeting next week. So uh, I suppose the question to the, to the committee is uh, what time to begin that meeting um, given that the committee of the whole will begin at 6.30. Council member Volan, you're the chair of that. I am the chair, but I uh, am not in control of the committee of the whole, which has never put time limits on itself. So it's hard to predict when that meeting is going to be done. Uh, if the person who would chair the committee of the whole would commit to uh, an end time for that meeting, then it would be easier to schedule this meeting. Um, I, although I would ask Councilmember Piedmont Smith, who's um, uh, concerns uh, caused the committee to vote to uh, have a second meeting if she can anticipate how much time she might uh, like to have in that meeting in order to uh, deal with it because perhaps we can be done if we start the meeting at 530 perhaps we can be done before committee of the whole but otherwise I would simply ask the committee of the whole to name a stop time now so that we can schedule this meeting afterwards. I'll open a debate. Well, I, I, I'm not so sure you can commit to a, a time on the committee of the whole with the presentation. Um, my thought was that we would start the administration committee meeting at 530. Here's the thing. Part of the point of the standing committee process is there are two meetings so that you don't have to have to go all night. If you decide you only need to, an hour and a half uh, and you guys wind up meeting more, well, you can always have a second meeting. So, uh, you know, if, if the committee of the whole decides to have two hours, it's fine with me. 8.30 is an acceptable time to start uh, uh, admin committee. But, uh, you know, I don't know that 45 minutes is gonna be enough for us. Again, that's why I mentioned Councilor Piedmont Smith. Councilmember P. Ma Smith, did you have any comments on that? that I don't really understand why I should be involved. I'm not on the committee. That's, that's so. kind of what I was thinking. Um, Mr. Lucas or Mr. Flair, do you have any comments on that? What? Okay, what I would suggest, and I think we're asking to have a time limit on the committee, and I'm not so sure that's proper. Um, I would suggest we either schedule the administration meeting for a 530, or I think um, if we have to, um, we can go as late as 945 to schedule standing committee. I would say um, 9 p.m. To, to make sure there's plenty of time. Is that acceptable to you, to Mr. Mr. Volden? Uh, I would prefer, I mean, the reason I, I asked Councilor Piedmont Smith is that it was her objections to the question of uh, fiscal impact statements that was that that caused the um, the referral to a second committee hearing, um, uh, if she has a presentation or you know like if because right now I'm expecting that it's not going to be a particularly long discussion in which case I'd be fine with a 5:30 meeting, and I'll bring that meeting in on time. Um, uh, if it's, there's going to be any kind of, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm trying to make space 
for Councilor Piedmont Smith's concerns about that ordinance, which is why, because she, she expressed concern to the committee. Um, so I, I, I apologize for putting her on the spot like that. Um, but, uh, you know, like I, I'm not sure how long those objections are going to take to hear. Um, but my inclination at this point is to just say 530 and forego. But I would also point out that it is entirely in order to schedule the Committee of the Whole to end at a certain time. There is nothing wrong with it at all. We're just not accustomed to it. Thank you. Councilmember Piedmont Smith. Yeah, I didn't realize I was the only one who had concerns about doing away with fiscal impact statements, but I don't want to get into the, the, the meat of that um, ordinance that is to be discussed by the administration committee next week. I'm not on that committee, um, but I understand uh, now uh, Council Member Volan's point, and I do plan to bring uh, an amendment to um, strike that part of the ordinance. So if that has an impact on how long you think the committee will meet, then you can consider that. Thank you. Um, in discussing it as part of um, scheduling earlier, um, in understanding the main, or well, not the main, but one of the, the topics that would be discussed um, mainly would be the fiscal impact statements. And having discussed that, we still thought an hour would be or starting at 5.30 would be adequate time. So Mr. Flaherty or Mr. Lucas or the chair, is it proper to have a motion to start this administration committee at 5.30? Mr. Chair, I move, I move as such, I so moved. Second. Okay, it's been moved and second. Um, and, and the full motion is that the administration committee would meet on the January 27th at 5.30 p.m. Thank you. Um, do we have any um, questions from council? Any comments? Thank you. It's been properly moved and second. Will the clerk please call the roll? Yes, and I'm sorry. Can you repeat the time again for me, please? 27th at 530 p.m. Thank you. Okay, Council Member Sandberg. Yes. Rollo. Yes. Volan. Yes. Rosenbarger. Yes. Scambaluri. Yes. Sims. Yes. Flaherty. Yes. Piedmont Smith. Yes. And Smith. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. And that passes 9 0. We'll be in next Wednesday at 5 30 p.m. Um, for all members that are on the administration committee. Um, any other matters on council schedule, Mr. Lucas? Uh, just to note that the council has a work session scheduled for this Friday. Um, this work session would be an opportunity to hear about items that would be coming to the council for first reading at the February the 3rd regular session. Uh, those items um, could include uh, several ordinances, uh, one of which is a uh, petition from that came out of the Planning Commission for a rezone along East 3rd Street. Um, there is a, an ordinance for a water rate adjustment that I believe the Utility Service Board has been considering uh, that, that could come to the council. Um, there's also an ordinance that several council members have been working to draft uh, to put certain uh, protections and, and procedures in place uh, to protect uh, individuals experiencing homelessness, um, that those sponsors may be ready to speak about this Friday. Um, and finally, there is an annual, well, it's an interlocal agreement with the county for building code authority uh, that, it, that would be a resolution uh, to um, renew that agreement if the council desired that that may be ready for a council consideration uh, February the 3rd. Uh, I know that's a lot. So uh, my, my general, my normal question is how many council members might be able to attend that work session? Um, and I, I see <laughs> most, if not all of the hands raised. So uh, like we've been doing for months, we'll, we'll go forward with that work session. Um, and uh, 
again, thank you for working through the scheduling issues for next week uh, tonight. I know that was a bit uh, cumbersome, but um, that'll, that'll provide clarity for what's to happen next week. So thank you. Thank you for your assistance. Thank my colleagues for their patience. Um, it's interesting running, trying to run a meeting with this script and trying to meet all the things that we need to meet. Um, that is all of our business for this evening. Um, I will entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All right, moved and second. Thank you all. Have a great night and um, we'll talk soon. Thank you. Thank you very much.